do, I invite you into the privilege of listening to the Word of God together and following along. You can do that inside your bulletin on the screen, of course, and then there should be a Bible nearby under the pew uh, that you are seated in as well. We are in the Gospel according to Matthew, in chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. Hear now God's Word. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. And uh, if you're new here, if you're visiting with us, we are especially glad that you have joined us. This may be your first time here with us with NAPC. Maybe your first time in the building, or you may have live streamed for a number of weeks and. Uh, you decided that we aren't going to fight, and so you are here this morning in person. Uh, we praise God for that. We are in a series called High Invitation, High Challenge. And what this is in reference to this phrase is it's intended to point us to, as a church, who we, who we want to be, who we aspire to be. And this is patterned after Jesus' own life. Jesus himself was very high invitation. What I mean by that is that he welcomed all to come to him. It didn't matter if you were a sinner. It didn't matter if you were uh, seen as an outcast or a nobody. Jesus welcomed all people to come to him, but he was also very high challenged, and what we mean by that is that he never affirmed or um, gave a pass to people because of uh, uh, out, out of their own sinfulness. He never said, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. What he said was, come to me, I will bring forgiveness, and then leave your life of sin. He says that to, to all of us. So we want to model that as a church. We want to be high invitation, high challenge. And this is a little grid that I showed last week. Uh, different churches express different things. There's some churches, upper left, that they're, they're warm and welcoming and they don't really want to tackle and engage the difficult issues. And what happens there is a culture of consumerism. You come and you get your, your feel-good religion, and then you go about your life and do whatever you want. We don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to be low-challenge, low-invitation, and, and not much going on there except boredom. We don't want to be uh, low-invitation where we never talk about the grace of God and always high-challenge so that a culture of condemnation develops. No, we want to be in that upper-right quadrant to develop what we call a 
culture of discipleship. And what does that mean? It means that every single one of us is a work in progress. Amen? Amen. None of us have arrived. We won't arrive this side of heaven. And so we want to continue to be disciples of Jesus, following after Him, and always being willing to examine our own lives and to see where we fall short and to, by God's grace, become more like Jesus. So, is, is everybody clear on what high invitation, high challenge means? Can you shake your head if you, or give me an amen? Thank you. Okay. Now, the context of this series, High Invitation, High Challenge, is we are having a, uh, what we call our commitment campaign, where we are asking you to fill out a commitment card for the coming calendar year for what you will financially commit to the ministry and mission of NAPC. So, did, did you get a card in the mail this week? Can I get an amen if you got one? Wow. Wow. That was either um, really unenthusiastic or it hasn't yet arrived. I'm not sure which. Uh, we, we sent these out. Maybe, maybe you didn't receive them yet. Um, Maybe you're just not that happy about receiving them, but uh, they're on the way, and we want you to prayerfully consider what you would commit, because in, in the spirit of being high invitation, high challenge, um, we want to ask you to make a, a commitment with your finances to support the mission and ministry of the church, and that is for two reasons. One, uh, in order to function as a church, we need your your giving and your commitment. And, and two, for you personally, this is part of your discipleship. Okay? And and then next Sunday we're also going to put in the in the bulletin an insert for you to commit to serving. So it's it's being generous with your time, it's being generous with your uh, your money, your resources. And that's what we're talking about with, with when it comes to high invitation, high challenge. You may be brand new here and you may um, you may think, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure that this is the church that I want to be part of. That's fine. Uh, we're not asking you to, to make that commitment. But if you do consider this church your home, we're asking you to do that. And, and I want to um, just state that, that you all, those of you who are part of this church, um, most of you have been absolutely committed to um, playing out this, this part of your discipleship with, with what you have given. And I want to review this because it's really worth celebrating and worth uh, praising God for what He has done in the hearts of, of all uh, of the folks who are part of this church. Um, I want to remind you, Faith Forward is our, that was the name of our capital campaign to build this church. And uh, I know I've said this before, but it is worth celebrating what God has done. Uh, we, in 2020, we had this goal of raising $3.25 million. Commitments made in 2020 for the next three years, $4.5 million. And then what has come in, what people have given out, uh, we had somebody help us with this campaign, a guy named Greg Gibbs, who has done over 100 capital campaigns for churches. And what he said was you can expect about 92% of those, those commitments to actually come in. And uh, instead, we've had... Five million in giving for the capital campaign, and there's still a, a few more commitments out there to be fulfilled. But I and praise God for that. And all the while, for our ministry giving, that is for the mission and ministry of the church. If you look at where we are today, through last year, this week or this last Sunday in 2022, giving was 1.06 million. Our budget was a little bit higher for 2023, 1.12 million. And what has been given as of last Sunday, $1.15 million. That's, that's worth acknowledging and praising God because it speaks directly to what, we, what, what I am challenging you with. So many of you are already doing this and have done this for years. And um, praise God for that because that is exactly what Jesus calls us to do, to be generous with what we have. Maybe this is a, a new topic for you, or maybe this is a topic, frankly, I think a lot of churches, um, they, they, at, they talk about this a lot. And the truth is, Jesus did talk about money an awful lot. And He did. If you read the Gospels, you will see that He talks about money. Why? Because it's such a rival for what is most important in our lives. And, 
and yet there, there are churches that have uh, abused this, and we certainly are, are not doing that. We don't want to do that. So I, I just ask that uh, in all of this, you consider where you are, where your family is, in terms of your own generosity, and we're going to look at this really amazing part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount this morning, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 34. And what we're going to look at is five different things, okay? We're going to look at the, the right or the proper treasure, the proper eyesight, the, the, the right master, the right timeline, and the right priority. Those, those five things, okay? Precious. Father, you are always good. Your, your love for us never fails. And you love us so much that you want us to be free from those uh, desires, those objects, those gifts that would keep us from you. And money is certainly one of those that we all have to reckon with. If we are going to be faithful in following you, Jesus, we have to reckon with our resources and how we handle them. I pray, Lord, that all of us would do that. I first want to praise you and thank you for brothers and sisters who have been uh, just so faithful. And I'm, I'm grateful. And Lord, um, would you show all of us, whether whether we've been part of the church brand new, would you show all of us how we can faithfully apply this word to our lives so that you are glorified and so that we are free from uh, that which would keep us from being fully obedient to you. And pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this point one and then uh, less time on the following point. The, the first one is the right treasure in verses 19 through 21. Look in verses 19 to 21. Uh, I'm going to read 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And it's, it's pretty simple. We all understand this, uh, this analogy that Jesus is putting before the people that he preached to in the Sermon on the Mount and putting before all of us. If you buy stuff here, it is vulnerable. It's vul- vulnerable to moths and to rust and to thieves. Uh, how many of you remember the distinct smell of moth balls? Raise your hand. A lot of us. Um, I remember, and how many of you use moth balls today? All one of you, I think. Um, the mothballs are interesting. They, the, I remember playing hide and seek in my grandma's house, my grandma and grandpa's house, hiding in the closet. Dude, overpowering! Like, and the the longer I waited to be found, the more dizzy I got. And now we find that what what the the compound, the makeup of those mothballs is a, a carcinogen. Who knew? It's amazing. So why, did, why, why are mothballs used to prevent moths from eating clothing? Um, but Jesus is saying that the things that we have, they're vulnerable here in, in this life. And if we invest all of our resources in the things of this world, they're all going to wear out. The great, amazing new car that you bought five years ago doesn't look so great right now. The clothes that you bought ten years ago are um, maybe less stylish than you would like them to look. My guess is that they haven't worn out yet, but you're, you're maybe going to replace them. They don't look as stylish and, and on and on. Now, what's, what's also true, and this is very important, when you go to the Bible, you can't take one passage and absolutize that one passage. Does that make sense? Like, you have to look at, we believe all of the Bible is written by uh, men who are inspired by God the Holy Spirit. Okay? And therefore, the, the words of this book are the word, very words that God has for us. And if we look at the entirety of the Bible, well, we find that actually we do need possessions. And money is, is a good gift for all of us. And we are exhorted to be wise and to plan for the future. Here are just a few passages. Proverbs. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares the bread in summer and gathers the food in harvest. In other words, ants are a lot smarter than a lot of people because they, they know to prepare for the winter. 
They know to prepare for times. They know to prepare for retirement, so to speak. So we're instructed, exhorted, to work hard and to save and prepare. Here's another one, Proverbs 10, 4, and 5. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. I heard this other phrase similar to this growing up a lot. You better make hay while the sun shines. That's right. If you can work, you better work now because there might be a time when you can't work. So uh, it, we're exhorted to be wise with our time and our energy and our effort in order to gain. And um, just one more, Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So I, I hope you're getting the sense that the Bible actually teaches a lot about what we do with our resources, and money isn't bad. Uh, saving isn't bad. We all have to plan. If we have children, um, many of us want them to go to college, and, and um, maybe we're saving for them. We're thinking about retirement. Many of us are, are hope, hopefully putting money away so that we can retire eventually. And I think that it's, I, I just want to note that um, when we read Matthew 6, it can cause a little, almost schizophrenia. You know, like, do we save? Do we give? Do we give it all away? And, and I don't think we should be schizophrenic, but I do think that what Jesus is doing, particularly for a group like us in the 21st century, is there's, there should be tension between planning and preparing and being generous. There is tension in that. Because it's very easy, the Bible tells us, to be so planful and thoughtful, to save really well, and to do it um, just so well, that we end up feeling like we don't, even, we don't need God. You know, we, we, we've got all that we need. Why would we need God? We, we don't need Him anymore. And, and actually, what's, what's interesting is when the slaves, the Hebrew slaves, were freed from Egypt, and they were getting ready to go into the Promised Land, and they didn't have this land yet, God, through Moses, warns them what will happen as they experience abundance and the, basically the, the curse of success. This is, this is what God says, and it's, it's amazing. It's, it's relevant today. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. Your heart being lifted up is like being prideful. Oh man, I did all this. I'm so amazing. And, and you forget the Lord your God. And he goes on in verse 17, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. No, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. That was a warning when, believe me, the per capita income was quite uh, less than it is today. When, when the creature comfort that the Hebrew slaves had uh, was, was nothing compared to what we have in the 21st century. We all know this. And, and the same thing was true in the 1600s and 1700s. Does anybody know who this is? I hear murmurs, but does anybody have the courage to say it loudly? Okay, that's fine. It, it is pretty cool hair. I think it's a wig. His name is uh, Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was a, a preacher in Boston, actually a very influential public figure, and he was born in 1663. He saw this even back in the 1600s. And this, this is his, uh, one of his famous lines, Faithfulness begat prosperity, and the daughter devoured her mother. Does that make sense? Like, if, if you're faithful and you're smart and you plan and you save, then you will actually be prosperous, most likely. But often it's that very prosperity that leads us to forget about God. So it's a temptation. Now, it's not bad. Again, it's not wealth is not bad. It's, it's a wonderful gift. 
But it is a temptation to grow prosperous and then to forget about God. And then Jesus, um, he, he, what, what's the, what is the only way to counter this? It's to store up treasures in heaven. That's the only way. There is no other way to say, well, I know I have all this and I'm not giving very much, but I know in my heart I'm generous. Uh-uh. That doesn't work. The only way to do it is to actually put into practice storing up treasures in heaven, giving. And that's why Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the Bible, the heart is the center of the human person. It's where all of your desires and your emotions and your will uh, spring from. It's, it's the center of your being. Where your treasure is, there lies your heart. In other words, this is not a mystery. If you look at what you do with your money, that's what you love the most. That's where your heart is. And this is just a truism. It's not a. It, it's not an if then. It's just. It's true. Fish swim. Dog bark. Presbyterians must be encouraged to say amen. All of these are truisms. And the same is, is accurate with Jesus is saying, where your treasure is, there lies your heart. It, it's like a, uh, if you've ever played poker, have you ever played Texas Hold'em? Okay. If you're sitting around the poker table and, and the newbie, the, the rookie, uh, he, he's dealt two pocket rockets and he, and he looks at his two cards with the two aces. And he says, boom, yes, before anybody makes a bet. Well, and then he, he, he's like, oh, I mean, okay. Nobody's betting. Yeah, everybody else is folding. It's a tell what you do with your money. Whether your heart is with the kingdom of God or whether it is with you or your, your future or whatever. And um, I've seen this work in both ways. I've seen people who were not all that engaged in the life of this church, who through the capital campaign, big vision, audacious goal, gave tremendously, and they gave sacrificially and generously, and through that act became more engaged and committed to Christ and to His body. And I've also seen people who... Their, um, their heart is, is moved to be more generous, and the more generous they are, they already love Jesus, they're already following Him, but they're, they're moved to give, and that through that very giving, their heart is more engaged in the, the ministry of the church. Also, people who have, who have already given, and you know, they, they continue to consider this, their hearts, too, are, are moved. So it, it, it works both ways. If your heart is in it, you will give. And if your heart is not in it, if you give, then your heart will follow. And, and so um, where is your own treasure? That's the question. And I, I see just how amazing the Lord has worked. And, and I see this sometimes in most awa- amazing ways. It, it certainly is not in the volume of giving. Uh, at, at all the time. Sometimes it is, but I've seen people who are on fixed incomes who are tithing, who are giving 10%. It's amazing. I see students who are beginning to give and set that pattern. I see uh, successful entrepreneurs, executives giving 10% even as their income rises and they continue to do it. And that is pretty amazing. So it's happening in this church. Is it happening in your life? That's the question. Do you have the right treasure. Next, the right eyesight. The right eyesight. Um, Jesus, it, it, he changes the metaphor here and he talks about sight. The eye is in verses 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And what Jesus is saying here is that your, your eyes and what you see as true or false, that's a window that informs your, your soul. And you know how we all have blind spots? And sometimes we need to be 
Um, we need those blind spots to be shown to us. Often that happens if you're married. And that's really, uh, it, it's maybe not the most enjoyable thing, but it, it is very helpful. And um, that's what discipleship is as well, by the way. When we are in relationship with each other, we can, we can kind of point out one another's struggles if we don't know that they even are there. But what, what Jesus is saying is that if you cannot see what is true, if you can't see the light, man, your soul is, is dark. And this relates to giving. And I do think it relates to giving. If you look at the, the context of the entire passage, if you think that it doesn't matter what you give and what you do with your money, then, man, it is dark. It, how great is the darkness? And we need to be open to to this challenge. We need to see by the light of Scripture, by the light of Jesus' teaching, what He would have us do with what we have that we might be free from the enslavement to thinking that our money is going to solve all of our problems and insulate us from the troubles of life. No, we don't believe that. Amen? We believe that God alone is our hope and we practice that by giving, in part, by giving. So we want to have the right eyesight, and we also want to have the right master. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Again, this is, this is nuance. It doesn't mean you can't have money. It doesn't mean, I mean, elsewhere the Bible teaches that we need to provide, and that somebody who doesn't provide for their family is worse than an unbeliever. That's what Paul writes. So, look, we, we, we need resources, and we ought to work for them. But is money our master? And we might, be, we might think that we're doing well, but if we're not giving, we are not doing this well. And money is our master. So, you know, we talk about this at NAPC. We talk about how... Uh, we are instructed by the Word of God to work toward giving at least 10% of what comes into us, of what we earn. At least 10% in every household, every individual. And for some of you, that has been a practice. You've done that in your life. Others of you, this is brand new. This is a radical teaching. And next week I'm going to talk about how the Bible teaches us, uh, specifically with tithing. But... Um, that is a good way to ensure that you aren't trying to serve two masters, that you are trying to serve the living God. And also, by the way, our church tithes. So our budget every year, whatever comes in for our ministry and mission budget, we send out in partnership with other ministries. And I, I'm not saying this because uh, we are... We are worried about what God is going to do. God has provided over and over again. Amen? In our church, he, he has shown immense favor to us, and He will continue to, no doubt about that. And just to give you another picture of this related to the building, I don't know if you remember this. You were around uh, three years ago, and we were going through the capital campaign. This was the building that we said we were going to build. And um, it's just one... Section. This is the building that we actually built, and, and that's amazing. Why? Why? Because because the Lord provided through incredibly generous people, and we want to continue. This is not the. We know this. The building is not the final resting point, and now we can relax. No, we have a mission, and we, we as leaders, we put a one-year goal together every year. This is our 2023 goal. Let's say it together, actually to joyfully steward our God-given gift for outreach and care in our church and community. And there have been so many ways that the Lord has, has carried this out. There, there, I, I actually just met someone right before church started who's here because her neighbor and friend invited her here, prayed for her, and cared for her. And, here, and she's here. And I praise God for that. I'm glad that that you're here, Kathy, wherever you are. Um, we have been very intent on reaching out to the community to invite people to the open. We've been at farmer's markets. We've, we've, been, we've put yard signs out. And many, many people have come out. And some of you have come because you were invited by someone that you knew or you saw a, a yard sign. 
uh, as, as staff, we've gone to the high school because we want to partner with our schools and care for our teachers and, and the staff at the school. So we went to, actually not just the high school, every building in, in the New Albany School campus, and we have gone several times to give them care packages and just let them know we love them and we care about them. And, and there's so many additional examples. There are so many bags for Thanksgiving uh, giveaway that are over there in that hallway that, that you have brought. We're doing a Christmas thing as well. We're doing all kinds of outreach. We're investing in uh, with our uh, ministries in Linden, in Mexico, in Uganda, and in this community. And we will continue to do that as the Lord leads. Amen? But it's true that God commands us to be generous for our good, and it is only by being generous that we demonstrate that God is, in fact, our master, and that money is not our master. And this also relates to our thinking about the future. We need to have the right timeline or the right horizon for worry. And what is that timeline? Today. Today. We worry about today. But Jesus says, Do not be anxious about your life and what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will put on. And, and then if you look down at the bottom in verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, how many of you find this to be a really easy command to follow? Okay, one less than those of you using mothballs. I mean, we all, I think, struggle with anxiety in one form or another. We're not commanded to, to not think about our future and to not plan. But what Jesus is saying is that the God who has provided for us thus far will continue to provide. And yes, we use our brains and we use all of the resources that we have to think wisely and prepare wisely about the future. But if you want a good barometer again, for whether or not this, the planning and saving that you're doing is, is um, honoring Christ, it's take a look at, at what you are giving. Because Jesus says very clearly that, you know, we don't have to worry about the future. And, and he, he tells us that just like the lilies of the field are clothed in greater splendor than Solomon, if you don't know Solomon, he was one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. And, you know, the birds, they don't do a lot of storing for the future, and we do have to store for the future, but... We also need to know that God provides for the birds, and God will provide for us as well. And, and so, he says the Gentiles, in verse 32, the Gentiles seek after these things, and in this context, he's speaking to Jewish people, and he's saying, you who know God, don't, don't worry about these things. He's saying to us, you Christians, you don't need to worry about these things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And so, it's not to minimize the struggle with anxiety for some. It is a terrible struggle. And um, you are in counseling or you are taking medication to help you overcome anxiety. Nothing wrong with that. But for, um, for all of us, a, a good barometer of our, um, our sense of God providing for us is if we are willing to risk some of what we have and give generously. And actually, as I said, it works both ways with, you know, giving and, and your heart kind of conforming to what you give to. As you give, it actually, um, there might be an initial spike in anxiety. I can't believe I'm committing this. But then as you give, you see that God provides. You see that He does it for you. And, and he, he gives you what you need even as you give generously. So the right timeline for our worry is today. Sufficient. Today is sufficient enough. It has enough trouble of its own. And, and as much as we can, we try to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. And one expression of that is how we are generous. And then finally, the right priority. And this all is summarized. But seek first, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you as well. In other words, be at peace and give generously. And I'm not saying just to this church, just to this local church, give to ministries that advance the kingdom of God, but be at peace and give 
because God is good all the time and He provides what we need. In fact, how would we know that we ought to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Well, we know this because of what God has provided for us. He's given us His very Son. All of us, you, you know the Gospel. All of us were created in the image of God to know Him and love Him. And yet, every single one of us has turned away from God. We have gone our own way. We have taken the gifts instead of the giver. We have worshipped those gifts. We have thought that we could find all of our security if we just were smart enough and planned well enough. And yet, we know that's not true. We know that we are going to die. And it says in Hebrews 9, it is appointed for man to die once and then comes the judgment. And if we stand on our own and think that we've done enough good deeds or we've given enough or anything like that, we will be terribly mistaken. And yet, if we simply listen to the calling that Jesus has given, that all would come to Him, this incredible invitation to come to Him, to repent of sin, leave our life of sin, and trust in Him, we will be forgiven. Because God did not spare His own Son for us and our salvation. Amen? And if God is that way, then can we trust Him with our resources and be generous? The answer is yes, we can. We can trust Him. The right priority is not, in every case, for every contingency, making sure we have it covered. No. The right priority is trusting God trusting His Word that tells us to be generous and seeking first His kingdom and then knowing that the things that we need will be given to us as well because the things that we need, the one thing that we need, has been given to us already in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank You so much for Your love for us and thank You that uh, though we don't deserve it, You have freely given to us Lord, I pray that we would follow in your example simply by giving generously. And Lord, I pray for, I'm so grateful for brothers and sisters who have been doing this for years. May they continue to. And I also pray for those who have not been, are not giving generously. And your word talks about tithing. I pray that, that they would consider what it means to actually give generously and to make it. I pray that every household, husband, wife, uh, would, would talk about this as they leave here. I pray that uh, those who are single would consider this and talk to you about this or talk to a trusted friend about this. And Lord, I pray that that would happen, that we might faithfully seek first your kingdom and know that the things that we need will be added to us as well. Thank you, and thank you most of all for Jesus. And thank you that you did not spare your own son, that we might know you. And I pray for everyone here, for those who may not even uh, know you yet today and who are here just checking things out, I pray that you would send your spirit, that they might repent of sin and trust in you, Jesus. Father, hear us now as we pray according to how Jesus called us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.